Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to the 2022 Improving Edge Conference. Improving and I are honored to introduce you to our presenter today. David Rendall is a keynote speaker, a professor, stand-up comedian, author of four books, and in his spare time, he's been known to complete 100-mile runs on the weekend. Ladies and gentlemen, let me introduce you to David Rendall, who will be sharing his presentation entitled Freak Factor. The floor is all yours, David. Hello, everyone. It is exciting to be here. It's a weird world. I just got finished with a live presentation in person um, and then quickly jumped over here to work with you all. And then I have another presentation right after this. I think there's um, part of what we'll talk about today is there's sometimes hidden advantages inside of disadvantages. And I think that's definitely true for uh, virtual events. It's not really possible to do three in-person events in a day. Um, but it is possible to do multiple virtual events. And there's some cool things we can do in Zoom that um, we can't do in other kinds of uh, in other kinds of formats. So I'm going to go ahead and share my screen here, and we're going to get started. So I want to talk to you today about the freak factor, this idea that what makes us weird also makes us wonderful, and what makes us weak also makes us strong. And it's going to be in two parts. The first part is thinking differently, right? So what are we thinking differently about? There's two main goals for this presentation. I want to help you get better. I want to help you help other people to get better. This can be personally or professionally at home or at work, but this presentation is designed to help you get better and to help other people get better. And it starts with thinking differently. The first part is about thinking differently. The second part is about acting differently. And the first part of thinking differently is this idea of awakening that everything we've learned about weakness is wrong. Now, why am I talking about weaknesses when I said we were going to talk about how to get better and how to help other people get better? Because the primary way that we try to fix or to make people better is to fix weaknesses. Our parents, our teachers, and our employers teach us that the way to get better is to find what's wrong and fix it. Find your weaknesses and fix them. Find other people's weaknesses and fix them. And I want to give you a completely different perspective on getting better today and a completely different perspective on weaknesses. So this story goes all the way back to when I was a kid and I was always in trouble at school. I was always in trouble at school for three things. I couldn't sit still, be quiet, or do what I was told. That means that the teachers didn't like me very much. They called me obnoxious, rebellious, inappropriate, immature, told me I had no self-discipline and no self-control. And if I couldn't fix those things, I was going to end up homeless and living in a van down by the river. Sooner or later, the teachers would give up on me and they'd send me to the principal's office. I remember I was in third grade. I was eight years old. I got sent to the principal's office. He sat me down on his lap, which seems questionable now looking back on it. He told me a story about three kinds of bad people. And the first thing I noticed was this was only a story about bad people. There were no good people in the story. He told me there were bad people, really bad people, and people who were too far gone. He told me I was a really bad kid on the verge of being too far gone if I couldn't learn to sit still be quiet and do what I was told. Now he had the right intentions. He wanted to help me, but he had the wrong framework. He had the wrong mindset. He had the right goal, but he had the wrong way of getting there. He was teaching me what his parents, his teachers and his employers had taught him about success, which is that you need to find weaknesses and fix them. You need to find other people's weaknesses and fix them. I'm not the only one who had trouble at school. Ken Robinson says many highly talented, brilliant, creative people think they're not because the thing they were good at at school wasn't valued or was actually stigmatized. Many highly talented, brilliant, creative people think they're not because the thing they were good at, their strength, wasn't valued. It was ignored or denied or it was actually stigmatized. We tell people at home, at work, at school that the best thing about them, that their biggest strength is actually a weakness. At home, my parents called me motor mouth in a constant attempt to remind me that my biggest problem was my inability to be quiet. I'm sure some of you have worked into situations, and I certainly have, where you thought you were bringing your best to work, but what your manager saw or what your coworkers saw or what HR saw was weakness instead of strength. Many highly talented, brilliant, creative people think they're not because the thing they were good at, their strength wasn't valued. It was ignored or denied where it was actually stigmatized. And I realized that this described perfectly exactly what happened to me. Because as an adult, I became a professional speaker. 
And now I get paid to stand up, not to sit down. I get paid to talk and not to be quiet. I get paid to run my own business, not to do what other people tell me to do. As I said in the intro, and I wasn't really thinking about it for that pur purpose, I'm at a hotel in a different city, gave a presentation throughout the whole morning this morning, ate a quick lunch, came over here, and I have to immediately be ready to click over to a different presentation when I'm done with this. I'll be doing three presentations today. It's my job. I make a living doing the things that my parents, teachers, and employers spent my whole life telling me to stop doing, not even to really do less of it, but you just need to really get that under control. Your biggest problem is your inability to be quiet. And now I get paid to talk. I can't really overemphasize that. I built a life around doing the thing that well-intentioned people gave me the advice that I need to stop doing it because I discovered that my weaknesses were also Strengths. I couldn't sit still because I wanted to be very active. You heard that I did my first 100 mile running race last year. I couldn't be quiet because I had a lot to say. I didn't want to do what I was told because I wanted to be in charge of my own life, my own work, my own future. I have weaknesses. We all have weaknesses, but those weaknesses are also strengths. And when I learned that my weaknesses were strengths, I started to wonder if other people had weaknesses that were also strengths. And that's where this presentation came from. Now, to be clear about two things, I'm not saying that people don't have weaknesses. Right? This presentation wouldn't make sense if people didn't have weaknesses. What I'm saying is those weaknesses are also strengths, right? That quality is good and bad at the same time. It has advantages and disadvantages simultaneously. And that's the other thing that I'm not saying. I'm not saying that you'll turn your weaknesses into strengths. This isn't a presentation about how to turn your weaknesses into strengths. In fact, I believe that we don't do that. I'm not trying to get, I'm, I'm still bad at sitting still, being quiet and doing what I'm told I haven't fixed those weaknesses. I'm not trying to turn those weaknesses into strengths. I've acknowledged the reality that I can't do that because I can do these other things, right? And so this isn't about turning weaknesses into strengths. And it's not failing to realize that we all have weaknesses. It's just acknowledging that those weaknesses are also strengths at the same time. So my main message today, and we'll repeat this throughout the presentation, is that what makes us weird also makes us wonderful, and what makes us weak also makes us strong. So the second part of thinking differently is awareness. Weaknesses are clues to our strengths, and we have to know what our strengths and weaknesses are if we're going to be effective. Parker Palmer says, we're led to truth by our weaknesses as well as our strengths. And I want to show you how we can use our understanding of our weaknesses and other people who love to tell us about our weaknesses to lead us to our strengths. So we're going to practice. And what I want you to be able to do for this is I want you to um, use the chat. So go into the chat, make sure you've clicked on everyone. Um, go into the chat, Click on everyone. I'll type in hello um, so you can see where we are. Make sure it's set to everyone so people can see it. And what we're going to do is I'm going to tell you a story about my youngest daughter. I'm going to tell you a story about her weaknesses. And as you listen to me telling you about her weaknesses, I want you to tell me about her strengths in the chat. So I'm only going to give you negative inputs, and I want you to give me positive feedback. I'm going to tell you her weaknesses. I want you to tell me her strengths. Now, this isn't something we normally do, right? But I promise you, you'll be able to do it. I just got done doing this a few minutes ago. I've done this with audiences all over the world. Um, I've done this a lot on Zoom. It's actually more fun on Zoom because people start typing almost immediately because nobody has to take turns. So I'm going to tell you about my daughter's weaknesses. I want you to listen for her strengths. I want you to see for yourself. I want you to practice for yourself this idea that weaknesses could also be strengths, that things that look bad could also be good at the same time. So this story is about Sophia. She's my youngest daughter and we only have three kids and she's the third, right? She's the third because she's difficult, right? She's difficult. And we didn't have a fourth because she was so difficult. We decided we didn't want to have more kids. In fact, we felt like it was irresponsible for us to continue producing children at such a low level of quality that we decided to shut the factory down, right? So Sophia is difficult. One of the things that makes her difficult is she, when she was four years old, she looked my wife and I in the eye. She said, I hate you. And I wish I had another family. I didn't know how to respond to that. I was like, wow, 
you know, that's some pretty brutal feedback. You know, I thought you were supposed to give me world's greatest dad mugs or something like that for Father's Day. I didn't expect one of my children would say, I hate you and I wish I had another family. So I wasn't sure how to respond. I was like, well, I guess, oh, I guess I appreciate your openness. Um, and uh, the way that you're sharing your feelings with us. Um, and I guess in the spirit of transparency, we should let you know we've been feeling the same way about you. You know, we didn't know that we could say that out loud, uh, but we're hoping to find you another family um, before the next trade deadline, right? So Sophia is difficult. Um, and you, have, you guys are already on fire. And this is what I love about Zoom is again, in hand raising situations, um, you know, people have to take turns and also it doesn't really work to do it while I'm still talking, but it does in Zoom. And so this is one of the things, Zoom is a good example of Zoom isn't, isn't as good as live presentations in some ways, um, but it's also better in some other ways. And I think that's something we can take away from the pandemic is that there's trade-offs, weaknesses, and strengths in a lot of different kind of formats, and a lot of different kind of things. And I think we want to make sure we don't lose some of the advantages of certain formats just by saying, oh, good, now we're going to get back to normal. Uh, but let's look here. Rudolph says she's a spitfire. She's spirited. Uh, David says she has strong opinions. Paige says she can communicate feelings. Ray said transparency, which then I just yeah, said after that. Um, uh, Strong-minded, direct freedom to be honest. Um, that she felt safe enough to do that. That's a great one. Expressive, independent, and strong. Speaks her mind straightforward. <laughs> Scott wins so far. Available. One 12-year-old boy looking for a new home. Hey, I don't have any um, boys, um, Scott, so maybe we can uh, do an even trade here. She's 15, already has her permit, uh, but maybe we can work something out there, right? So I love the way this is going already. So here's what I want you to notice already. Look at how quickly you were able to identify Sophia's strengths when I only told you about weaknesses. And it's only been, we're only 13 minutes into the presentation and I just told you that weaknesses might be strengths. And look how fast so many people were able to identify strengths when all I told you about is weaknesses. Because that's not what we normally do. Normally when we see weaknesses, we start looking for other weaknesses. We don't look for strengths. We look for what else is wrong with that person, right? So look how quickly you were able to do that. And as her father, not only did you do it quickly, but you did it incredibly accurately. You know my daughter's strengths, even though you only know her weaknesses, right? And that hopefully helps you to see how true this is and how true this is for you. But we're going to keep going. There's more weaknesses in store. So one of the things that makes Sophia difficult is that she's a liar, right? She's a liar. And so I want to tell you about my favorite lie that she ever told. She told it in kindergarten on her first day of school. And what we sent her to school and the teacher said, you know, you need to send your kid with a snack and a lunch, uh, not just a lunch, but a snack and a lunch. And so we gave, she got a, a, a snack and a lunch. She got a little bottle of water and some Ritz crackers and she showed up at school on the first day with her snack and her lunch. And the teacher said, okay, it's time to get out your snack and your lunch or your snack is snack time. She, she gets out her snack and she gets out her water and her crackers, her Ritz crackers. Uh, but she notices that some other kids don't have a snack. Now, careful here. Don't you? It, it's not that these other kids were poor or struggling financially. They're, they, they have money. They're doing fine at the school that she goes to. Uh, they just forgot. Their parents forgot. They forgot to bring their snack. But she notices they don't have a snack. And then she notices the teacher goes and gets them some cookies and some juice. Now, I don't know if you remember what it's like to be five years old, but cookies and juice is the thing, right? Cookies and juice is the thing. And so she sees these kids getting cookies and juice and she is not pleased. She's like, this is some bull crap right here. I'm over here with crackers and water, basically prison rations. And these delinquents over here are getting cookies and juice. I want cookies and juice. So she raises her hand, first day of school, teacher calls on her. She says, um, Sophia, what can I do for you? And Sophia says, I forgot to tell you earlier, I'm actually allergic to water. Sophia sold all her credibility on day one of school for some cookies and some juice. Sophia's difficult and Sophia's a liar. Those are Sophia's weaknesses, but let's check the chat and find out more about what you all think her strengths are. As soon as I said she was a liar, 
Shervin said creative. David said creative. Rudolph said inventive. Margie said imaginative, which is creative thinking. Scott said storyteller. Margie said observant. Chelsea said smart. Anthony said adaptive. Ray said observant. Chelsea said logical. And Rudolph said smart. Right? Let's just take imaginative, right? Sometimes, you know, she's the most imaginative kid I have. She has all the dolls and all the stuffed animals, and she never plays a game in the way that it was originally designed. And sometimes she tries to sell her imagination as reality, and we call that dishonesty. But Sophia isn't just a sociopath, right? She's not fundamentally immoral. She's a person with a weakness that's also a strength. And here's what's crucial. Do you think it changes my relationship with my daughter that I see her weaknesses and her strengths instead of just seeing her weaknesses, right? And look at how quickly you were able to do this, right? Look at how quickly and how accurately you were able to do this. The freak factor is based on the simple and yet surprising idea that every weakness has a corresponding strength, right? And once we can start to see the strengths that correspond with the weaknesses, it starts to change the way that we see ourselves and the way we see other people. And if we change the way we see other people, we start to change the way we behave towards those people. So let's keep going, right? What makes us weird also makes us wonderful. What makes us weak also makes us strong. So the next step is acceptance to see that weaknesses are strengths in disguise. <coughs> we don't just need to know our strengths and weaknesses. We need to accept, we need to acknowledge that reality of the connection between strength and weakness. A good way to think about this is like side effects. Every medicine has side effects. There's no such thing as a medicine without side effects. So what I'm telling you today is there's no such thing as a person without side effects. Every person has side effects. And if you want to reduce the side effects of a medicine, you have to reduce or not even take the medicine, which or reduce the, the, the amount of the medicine that you take, which reduces the benefit of the medicine. You can't get the benefit of the medicine without risking the side effects. And you can't get the benefits of people without risking the side effects, right? Every person has side effects, just like there's no perfect medicine, there's no perfect person. Peter Drucker said it this way. He said, strong people always have strong weaknesses too, where there are peaks, there are valleys. If you want to work with strong people, you want to be married to a strong person, you want strong children, strong people always have strong weaknesses too, where there are peaks, there are valleys. And we can't have the peaks without the valleys. Now, some of you are like, boo, I don't know, Dave, I want to fix it. You know, I don't, I, I thought we were getting better and helping other people get better. I didn't, I don't want to accept it. I want to fix it. But if we won't accept the connection between strengths and weaknesses, watch what happens. We're actually going to make things worse in our effort to make things better. And to illustrate, let's go to discount retail. Right? Walmart has one strength, low prices. Walmart has a bunch of weaknesses. We'll summarize with poor service, poor quality, and poor design. So let's fix Walmart. Let's fix service. Let's fix one of their weaknesses. Let's, let's hire more people. Let's train them better. Let's pay them better. Let's give them better benefits. What just happened to the costs at Walmart? They just went up. What just happened to the prices at Walmart? They just went up. What just happened to the only strength that Walmart has? It just went down. We broke Walmart in our effort to fix Walmart because we wouldn't accept the connection, the trade-off between the strength and the weakness. Let's go to Target, right? People call Target Target because it's better service, better quality, better design. Look at all those strengths. But the weakness is that their prices are higher than at Walmart. They don't really compete on price with Walmart. They don't have the same level of discount and efficiency as Walmart. So let's fix Target. Let's lower those prices. To do that, we're going to have to sacrifice service, quality, and design. And we're going to stop being Target and go back to being Target, right? In the effort to fix weaknesses, we end up damaging strengths because strengths and weaknesses are part of the same characteristic. They're two sides of the same coin. Now, what we've been taught is you just gotta be well-balanced and well-rounded. You gotta be the best of both worlds. You have to have a little bit of everything that everybody wants. And that's what they tried at Kmart, right? That's what they tried at Kmart. They were the low price leader. They had the distribution, the location, the reputation. They had everything they needed to succeed. They were the savings place. They were the blue light special. And Walmart came to town. All they had to do was lower their prices a little bit for a little while 
and Walmart would have gone out of business. But instead, they hired Martha Stewart, and they tried to be a little bit of Target and a little bit of Walmart, and they ended up bankrupt. They came out of bankruptcy, and they inexplicably bought Sears, and then together, Sears and Kmart went bankrupt again. It doesn't matter if you like Target or you like Walmart. They both succeed because they deliberately make a trade-off between weaknesses and the corresponding strengths. And Kmart became invisible, average, and mediocre because in their effort to fix all their weaknesses, they destroyed all of the corresponding strengths. And that's why I do this presentation. I don't want you to become average, mediocre, and invisible. I don't want your organization to become average, mediocre, and invisible. I don't want the people that you are trying to develop to become average, mediocre, and invisible. And the normal way that we try to do this, the way that our parents, teachers, and employers teach us to get better, the fixing weaknesses approach to getting better makes us average, mediocre, and invisible instead of better. In their book, Uncommon Service, Francis Fry and Ann Morris, Harvard marketing professors say that striving for all-around excellence leads directly to mediocrity. Striving for all-around excellence leads directly to mediocrity. I'm going to be good at it all, Dave. I'm going to be good at all the things. I'm not going to have any weaknesses. In your effort to be good at all of the things, you're going to end up not very good at any of those things. And that's why I say that what makes us weird also makes us wonderful, and what makes us weak also makes us strong. So the last step in thinking differently, the first part of the presentation, thinking differently. The second part, acting differently. If we see people differently, if we see ourselves differently, see the world differently, we see strengths and weaknesses differently, we would automatically behave differently. But the last part of thinking differently is appreciation. Don't just accept that weaknesses are also strengths. Be excited about that upside. Be excited about that advantage. Be excited about the peaks instead of so focused on the valleys. So George Eliot said, every limit is a beginning as well as an ending. So I want to tell you about the beginnings that come with the limits that we have, right? One of the limits that we have is dyslexia. If you have dyslexia, you struggle to read and struggle to write. If you struggle to read and struggle to write, you're going to struggle in school. And we've all been taught that if you struggle in school, you'll struggle in life, right? If you struggle in school, you'll struggle in life. That's why they were really surprised when they were studying millionaires in the United Kingdom and discovered that 50% of the millionaires in their study had dyslexia, even though 10% of the people in the general population have dyslexia. They were studying entrepreneurs in the United States and discovered that 35% of the entrepreneurs in their study had dyslexia, even though only 10% of the people in the general population have dyslexia. Ingvar Kamprad is the billionaire founder of the world's largest and most profitable furniture company, IKEA, and he had dyslexia. Richard Branson is the billionaire founder of the Virgin series of companies, and he has dyslexia. And what we're taught is, yeah, Dave, those people overcame their disability. It's a conquering of the weakness that made them successful, and that's not the story. They asked Richard Branson himself, how has dyslexia affected your success? And he said, strangely, I think my dyslexia has helped. Strangely, surprisingly, against what we've been taught to believe, I'm better because of my dyslexia not in spite of it. What scientists are starting to realize is that people with dyslexia don't have broken brains, they have different brains. And the same brain that causes them to struggle in school causes them to succeed in life at a higher level than most of the rest of us ever will. This guy's name is Paul Orfula. He got kicked out of four different schools because he had dyslexia and ADHD. So since he wasn't doing well at school, he thought maybe I can get jobs and he'd get employed and he'd get fired on the first day when he would get a job. And so then he started working for his own father in a family owned business and got fired by his own dad. So he had no real choice other than homelessness. And so he started his own business. It was so small that he had to pull the copy machine out onto the sidewalk so students and professors from the local college could make copies on his tiny little copy machine. And he built that one copy machine into a global multinational corporation called Kinko's, and he sold it to FedEx for $2.4 billion. And he said this, he said, I think everyone should have dyslexia. That's appreciation. They asked Paul Orfala, if we could give you a pill that would cure your dyslexia, would you take it? And he said, absolutely not. Because when you fixed my weakness, you would destroy my strength. 
When you took away the disadvantage, you take away the advantage. When you take away the valley, you take away the peak. Paul Orfala doesn't just accept his dyslexia and his ADHD. He appreciates it. He celebrates it. The subtitle of his book is basically how a hyperactive dyslexic built a billion dollar corporation. Paul Orfala knows that what makes him weird also makes him wonderful. So he feels more wonderful because he's so weird. He knows that what makes him weak also makes him strong. So he feels stronger because of the weaknesses that he has. So now it's time to act differently, right? I was just, like I said, I was just doing a presentation on the freak factor earlier. And when I told the story about Sophia, before I was even into it, some guy yelled out, she should be a politician. Right? He didn't just say what her strength was. He said, wait a second. If I'm starting to see a strength in these weaknesses you're describing, I can actually think of a situation that would reward Sophia for who she is instead of punishing her for who she's not, right? If we see people differently, we treat them differently. If we saw ourselves differently, we'd behave differently. If we think differently, we'd act differently. And the first thing we do is amplification. We turn up the volume instead of turning it down. One of the most common ways that people teach us to get better is like, oh, I really, you're, I love it that you're so organized, but if you could just dial it back, right? I love it that you're so intense, but if you could just dial it back. I love it that you're so analytical, but if you could just, I love it that you're so detail oriented, but if you could just dial it back, right? The most common feedback that we get when it comes to getting better is moderation, reduction, or complete elimination. Yeah, yeah, it'd be you, be you, but just not as much. And what I want to show you is it's not in the moderation, the reduction, the elimination, but in the amplification that we find success. This is Jimmy Kimmel. He's a late night talk show host. He's a comedian. He has his own television show. And he was asked to host the White House Correspondents' Dinner when Barack Obama was president. It's an honor. Only one comedian in the world gets asked to host the dinner each year. And at one point, he got up to the podium and he seemed to get him really serious. He said, I just want to thank Mr. Mills, my 10th grade history teacher, who told me that I would never amount to anything if I didn't stop screwing around. Uh, Mr. Mills, I'm about to high five the president of the United States of America. And then he did putting this woman in the most awkward picture of all time. And then he came back to the podium and he said, eat it, Mills. Now, I'm not here to be down on teachers. We talked about the difference between intentions and framework earlier. I think Mr. Mills had the right intentions, but he had the wrong framework. He had the wrong mindset. He was teaching Jimmy with his parents, his teachers, and his employers had taught him about success. He thought Jimmy had to, I mean, it's rough. He said, you'll never amount to anything. That's rough. My parents gave me hope. They said, you'll never amount to much, right? He didn't tell Jimmy to dial it back. He told him to shut it off. He said, you'll never amount to anything unless you stop screwing around. Moderation, reduction, or complete elimination. We think that's the answer because that's what our parents, teachers, and employers tell us. But let's watch what happened with Jimmy Kimmel. Mr. Mills told him you'll never amount to anything unless you stop screwing around. How did Jimmy Kimmel become one of the highest paid comedians on earth? He went pro at screwing around. He went full time at screwing around. He got more childish, more silly, more ridiculous, more immature. He turned the volume up on everything Mr. Mills told him to turn the volume down on. And that's when he found success. If you don't hear anything else from me today, it's this. It's not in the moderation, the reduction, or the elimination of who you are that you find success. It's in the amplification, right? It's in the amplification. How could you amplify those weaknesses that are also strengths. How can you turn up the volume on that characteristic that has a downside? Sure, that has a valley, sure, but also has a peak that also has an advantage, right? What makes us weird also makes us wonderful. If we believe that, we'd get weirder in order to become more wonderful. What makes us weak also makes us strong. If we believe that, we'd get weaker in some areas so we could get stronger in others. We turn up the volume on who we were. Now, you might be thinking, and you should be. Oh, that's not going to work at my job. That's not going to work with my boss. That's not going to work in my organization. That's not going to work because of the situation that I'm in. And you're right. 
amplification only works when you find alignment. We have to stop trying to fit in and start trying to find the right fit, right? One of my favorite examples of this comes from Denmark. There's a guy in Denmark and his name was Thorkil Son and he had a son with autism. Two of the classic symptoms of autism are hyper-focused and doing the same thing over and over again, right? And so because that's not normal, which is why I preach that what makes us weird also makes us wonderful because most people don't believe that. What makes us weird, most people think is a problem to be fixed, right? So what happens when someone has autism? Their characteristics are unusual. Therefore, they're put in therapy designed to help them because they shouldn't be like that because normal people aren't like that. So Thorkel Son has a son with autism. He's hyper-focused. He does the same thing over and over again. They're trying to fix that. But then Thorkel Son goes to work and he works in software testing. And he notices that in software testing, they need people who can hyper-focus and do the same thing over and over. They need employees who can hyper-focus and do the same thing over and over. Again, unfortunately, though, most normal people, most typical people can't hyper-focus enough, can't do the same thing over and over again very well. It turns out that typical people aren't very good at what they need software testers to do. So Thor Kilson looks at his son with new eyes. And instead of finding the right fit for his son, he creates the right fit for his son. And he starts a business called Specialist, and it means the specialists in Danish. And they do software testing, and they only hire people with autism to do the software testing. He hired his son and 49 other people with autism to do software testing. They've been so successful that the global software company, SAP, started looking for hundreds of people with autism to do software testing for them. Thor Kilson didn't change who his son was. He changed where his son was. He didn't change the person. He changed the place. Situations are powerful. They can either put the spotlight on the best things about us, or they can put the spotlight on the worst things about us. But the most important aspect of getting better and helping other people get better isn't changing who you are. It's changing where you are. It isn't fitting in. It's finding the right fit. It's identifying situations to put the spotlight on the best things about us and take the spotlight off of the worst things about us. Teachers would call me out in class for being disruptive. And they'd say, Dave, I guess you just want to be the center of attention. Don't you? They talked about it like it was a bad thing. What they were saying is this isn't the time or the place for you to be the center of attention. The problem was they never told me there was a time or the place to be the center of attention. And now as a professional speaker, it's my job to be the center of attention. It's my job to get people's attention. It's my job to keep people's attention. There was nothing wrong with who I was. There was a problem with the fit between who I was and where I was. And if you want to help other people get better, it won't primarily happen by changing the person. It will happen by identifying and seeking out, and in some cases, creating a better match between who they are and where they are. If you wanna be happier, if you wanna be more fulfilled, if you wanna be more successful, if you wanna be more effective. It's not by changing who you are to fit a situation. It's by gradually seeking out and adjusting the situations that you put yourself in, the volunteer opportunities, the part-time jobs, the full-time jobs, starting your own business, you start experimenting with what's the best fit between who I am and where I am. How do I stop trying to change who I am and start trying to change where I am? Think about how powerful Thor Kilson's example was, right? He took a disability, a diagnosable disability and turned it into a competitive advantage, not by changing who his son was, but by changing where his son was, not by changing the person, but by changing the place. The most important question when it comes to getting better and helping other people get better is how do we find the right fit, right? How do we help people find the right fit between who they are and where they are? How do we find the right fit between the person and the place? The next step is avoidance, right? If we're going to amplify, nobody's going to want us to turn up the volume unless we're in the right situation alignment. But if we're going to put ourselves in the right situation, then we have to stop putting ourselves in the wrong situation. One of, my, one of the first people who ever turned this presentation 15, 15 years ago when I was a college professor, she was so mad at the end of the presentation. She liked the presentation, but the message of the presentation was, you need to find the right fit and your weaknesses will look like strengths. And she realized she was in a job that wasn't the right fit. And she said, are you telling me 
that I have to quit my job. Right? That's ridiculous. I need my job. I need that money. That can't be the answer. Right? She was frustrated, but she was on the right track. I can't have the right fit unless I leave situations that have the wrong fit. I can't do things that fit me if I'm busy doing things that don't fit me. To be the best at some things, we have to be the worst at other things. This guy's name is Matthias Schlitt. He was born with a genetic abnormality called KTS. When you're born with KTS, one of your limbs, either an arm or a leg, will be gigantic in comparison to the others. It'll be that way starting at a very young age and it'll continue throughout the rest of your life. We have friends who have a daughter named Ava Lee, and for her, it's her right leg. But for Matthias Schlitt, it's his right arm. His right arm is 18 inches around. It's three times larger than his left arm, which is only six inches around. It's absolutely gigantic. Matthias Schlitt is weird, but what makes him weird also makes him wonderful, and what makes him weak also makes him strong. So he's an example of what we've already talked about and some of the things that we haven't talked about or one of the things that we haven't talked about. So let's go back to alignment, right? Where does somebody with a gigantic right arm find the right fit? If you know, type it into the chat, right? Matthias Schlitt didn't succeed by changing who he was. He changed where he was. He sought out a situation that rewarded him for having a gigantic right arm, right? And as you see in the chat, the answer is arm wrestling, right? Now that's not a very common sport. It's a pretty niche sport, but he found a situation in which he was the perfect fit. In fact, to the point that if you sat across from him, you'd be absolutely terrified. And you also might feel like this is unfair. Shervin added professional slapper, which is real, which he isn't, but maybe that's his next sport. Um, maybe once he takes it to the next, next level. And if you haven't seen professional slapping, you should definitely YouTube it after we're done with the presentation. But he became a professional arm wrestler alignment, which not only enabled, but demanded amplification. Now it's time to make this right arm even bigger than it already is because of the genetic abnormality, because it will be an advantage, an even bigger advantage in this situation. This is a crucial lesson. You'll know you found alignment when amplification is almost demanded, almost required, when people People or the situation requires that you turn up the volume on something you only previously would have turned the volume down on, right? Because you would have thought, oh, this can't possibly be good, or oh, I want to kind of cover up this arm, or I don't want people to see how big my arm is. And now it's like, oh, time to make it even bigger, time to exercise it and pump it up to make it even larger, right? Like we talked about earlier for me, my parents called me motor mouth to remind me that I needed to be quiet. And now people literally pay me to talk, right? I literally turned up the volume on a characteristic that people told me to turn the volume down on only because I found the right situation, right? Found the right situation where I can get rewarded for who I am. So you'll know you found alignment when amplification is almost required for that situation, but now it's time for the third piece. And the third piece is avoidance, right? Because look at that left arm, right? Look at that left arm that left arm could be bigger, right? He could pump up that arm. In fact, he's kind of trying to hide it with the sweatbands, make it look a little bigger. But here's the thing, he actually doesn't, and be ready in the chat, because I'm gonna ask you a question I want an answer to. He actually doesn't exercise his left arm. He actually doesn't exercise any of the rest of his body at all, and he does it on purpose, right? So here's my question for you. Why would Matthias Schlitt not exercise the rest of his body? We're not talking about abstract strength and weakness. Now, now we're talking about actual physical weakness. His left arm could be bigger and stronger, but he doesn't exercise it. He doesn't lift up. He doesn't do curls. He doesn't do forearm work. He doesn't work on his back strength on the left side. He doesn't do squats. He doesn't try to build up the strength in his legs. Why is Matthias Schlitt deliberately avoiding building strength and fixing weakness in any other part of his body other than his right arm? Does anybody know the answer to that? Why does Matthias Schlitt not want to big, build strength in the other parts of his body? Anthony says, maximum results from a finite resource. Margie says, focus on strengths to be the most successful. 
perception by not working in the other part the arm has the perception is even larger i love that little psychological warfare right chelsea like it's even more terrifying because it looks bigger in comparison and so there might be a little bit of intimidation factor but it's actually a little more practical than that right ah and sally just got it lower weight class is that a thing in arm wrestling and sally it shouldn't be because it's stupid but it is right weight class you arm wrestle by weight class they weigh your whole body and then you arm wrestle against somebody who weighs the same amount as you but then look at the way he's sitting you have to hold on to that thing with your other arm and you can only use your right arm in arm wrestling you can't use your legs. You can't use your left arm. You can't use the rest of your body. They put you in a position where it's arm wrestling. It's not body wrestling. It's arm wrestling. They weigh your whole body. And then you arm wrestle against somebody who weighs the same amount, but then you only get to use your arm. In wrestling, they weigh your whole body, but then you take your whole body out onto the mat. In boxing, they weigh your whole body, but you take your whole body into the ring. In MMA, they weigh your whole body, but then you bring your whole body into the cage. In arm wrestling, they weigh your whole body and then you only get to use your right arm. So Matthias Schlitt isn't just a genius for what he's done, alignment and amplification. He's succeeding because of what he deliberately doesn't do, right? He deliberately doesn't try to fix weakness. Here's one of the things people are going to say to you after this presentation. If you try to apply some of the things I've taught you in this presentation, here's the most common thing you're going to hear. What's it going to hurt? What's it going to hurt to get a little better at it? What's it going to hurt to work? Are you a little messy? What's it going to hurt to get a little more organized? What's it going to hurt to be a little bit more polite? What's it going to hurt to be a little more analytic? What's it going to hurt to let go, let go of the details a little bit, not be such a per uh, perfectionist? What's it going to hurt? That's what it's going to hurt. You can either be focusing your time and energy on things that move you forward, that, that build on your strengths, that align with who you are, that allow you to amplify who you are. You can only do that if you're avoiding things that you aren't and not using your time, energy, and resources, right? How many of you have unlimited time, energy, and resources? You don't, right? So why would you waste those working on something that, and this is crucial, what's it going to hurt? Remember Matthias Schlitt, any muscle that he puts on any other part of his body counts against him on the scale and doesn't help him in the wrestling match. It counts against him on the scale. It makes him wrestle against a larger, more fearsome opponent. And it doesn't benefit him in the actual fight. That's what it's going to hurt. We're all arm wrestling by weight class, right? And what we need to understand is what matters and what doesn't matter. And one of the things that doesn't matter is fixing our weaknesses, just like Walmart, just like Target, just like Kmart, fixing your weaknesses isn't going to make you better. It's by building on that corresponding strength, building on the upside, taking advantage of what you have, instead of trying to create something that you don't have or fix a weakness, right? So what should you stop doing? We need alignment. We need amplification, but we also need avoidance. We need to let go of things that don't match, that don't fit, that don't align with who we are. The last step is affiliation. Partner with people who are strong where you're weak, especially right after avoidance. Some of you are like, well, if I'm not going to do it, who is going to do it? If I'm not going to do it, it still has to be done, right? And that's a great question, right? And it's a fair question. And the answer is we need to partner with people who are strong or we're weak. Paul Orfalo, remember him? The founder of Kinko sold it for $2.4 billion, right? How did he run a company worth $2.4 billion when he couldn't read or write? What did he do? It's simple. He just hired people who could. It's called collaboration. But here's why it's not simple. From age five to age 22, Two, when you're a student in school, if you hire someone to do what you can't do related to your schoolwork, what's that called? That's called cheating. From age five to age 22, partnering with someone who's strong where you're weak, hiring somebody who can do what you can't do is called cheating. From age 23 on, it's called collaboration and it's your best chance for success. See, school doesn't just teach science and English and math, it teaches us untrue lessons about the way the world works. And the lesson when you're in school and you're not doing well is if you're not doing well in that, you have to get better. If you are not proficient in that, you have to get better. If you have a weakness in that area, you have to get better. You have to be good at all the subjects. You have to be good at all the things in school. You have to be good at extracurriculars. You have to get good grades to get into a good college, to get a good job. You have to be good at all the things. And if you're not, you have to fix yourself. And that's not actually true in real life. Because for the rest of our lives, we can partner with people who are strong or we're weak in a way that we don't get sanctioned the way we get sanctioned in school. In fact, it's called running a business when you hire people who can do things that you can't do. And in school, it's the most disqualifying choice you could make. 
Paul Orfila ran a company worth $2.4 billion, even though he couldn't read and write simply by, because he hired people who could. He was willing to acknowledge his weaknesses. And instead of trying to fix them, he hired people who could do what he couldn't do. Peter Drucker said, organizations exist to make people's strengths effective and their weaknesses irrelevant. If you don't have any other goals for the second half of 2022, Every day when you walk into work, ask yourself, am I making my strengths effective and my weaknesses irrelevant? Am I making other people's strengths effective and their weaknesses irrelevant? If you just focus on this one thing, you're going to be more successful than most other people in most other organizations because most people in most organizations are making their weaknesses really, really relevant and making their strengths ineffective. This goes beyond organizations. I think schools should exist to make people's strengths effective and their weaknesses irrelevant. And unfortunately, too often they don't. I think families should exist to make people's strengths effective and their weaknesses irrelevant. I think relationships should exist to make strength, people's strengths effective and their weaknesses irrelevant. Are you trying to make your spouse or partner's strengths effective and their weaknesses irrelevant? Trying to make your kids' strengths effective and their weaknesses irrelevant. But also remember yourself too, are you trying to make your, sometimes we're trying to do this for everybody else, but we won't do it for ourselves. We feel like we're the ones that's supposed to do everything that's left. That's not true either. We need to make our strengths effective and our weaknesses irrelevant. So who's strong where you're weak, right? Who's strong where you're weak? I want to put this all together because I've been married for uh, 27 years um, to my wife, Stephanie. Um, I'm six foot six. She's five foot three. People wonder how that works. I'm so tall. She's so small. I tell people that in our relationship, deodorant is more important than breath mints, right? But one of the things that my wife and I argue about is she's very structured, which also means she's inflexible. That's her strength weakness combination. She's always taking away my water. I always have water with me everywhere. It's got to stay hydrated um, in order to stay athletic and to take care of myself and just stay healthy. It's important to have water. Mm. Delicious and refreshing. But anytime I set my water down at my house, it always disappears, right? It always disappears. My wife always takes it to the recycling or puts it in the dishwasher. And, and she doesn't care about my complaints that she's always stealing my water and pissing me off. She wants things to be clean. She wants things to be organized. She wants to be structured. And because she's structured, she's also a little bit inflexible. When my cup isn't in the right place, it's in the wrong place. When uh, she doesn't know why something's out, she just goes ahead and puts it away because she wants things to be organized. And my wife's a lovely person. She just wishes the rest of us didn't live at the house with her, right? So how have we stayed married for 27 years if she's constantly stealing my water and making me mad? If she's constantly harassing me about things like that, why are we still married, right? And so this is an opportunity to put this all together, right? And I'm going to do that by telling a story about batteries. My wife was on a trip in another country and my kids needed some AA batteries. And I called up my structured and inflexible wife and asked her where the batteries were. She said, well, you go down the hall to the left in the closet, third shelf in the back. On the right side, there's a plastic tub labeled batteries right next to a plastic tub labeled label maker. In the back of the tub labeled batteries is where we have the AA batteries. We currently have five AA batteries. Three of them are Energizer, two of them are Duracell. Be careful, one of the Duracells is rechargeable. And at that moment, I'm not upset with my wife anymore, am I? I'm thinking to myself, I am so hot for you right now, right? My wife is different from me. My wife has different strengths and weaknesses for me. My wife is strong where I'm weak. She's also weak in ways that I'm strong. And I can affiliate with her. I can partner with her because I'm aware of her strengths and weaknesses, right? I'm aware of her strengths and weaknesses, structure and inflexibility. I accept that structure and inflexibility are two sides of the same coin. I appreciate the structure instead of being frustrated about the inflexibility. And now I can partner with her. I can affiliate with her because I can accept and appreciate who she is instead of trying to change it. And now my life is more well-balanced and more well-rounded. And my life is more organized without me being my, more organized. My life is more well-balanced and well-rounded without me being more well-rounded and well-balanced. My life is more organized without me being organized only if I can be aware of, accept, and appreciate somebody who's different from me, right? 
We have to think differently in order to act differently. We have to see people differently if we're going to treat them differently. So let's wrap up with an illustration. This is the Leaning Tower of Pisa. If you're not sure what's wrong with it, it's leaning. It's been leaning since 1173, since the very moment it was being built. It's been leaning for 849 years. And in the 1930s, Mussolini, who was the leader of Italy at the time, decided that this was a national embarrassment and not a national treasure. And so he ordered his government engineers to straighten it up. And they tried and they failed. And that was a really lucky thing for the city of Pisa, wasn't it? Because you see, millions of people have traveled millions of miles and spent millions of dollars to see a tower that leans. And the people who run the tower now finally understand that. They say because of its inclination, the tower has become the object of very special attention. That's what I'm telling you today. I'm saying it's because of your inclination, because of your unique strengths and weaknesses, that your life, your work, your business, your relationships become the object of very special attention. Oftentimes, we think our job as adults, as leaders, as parents is to straighten people up and to straighten people out, and it is not. It's to preserve that tilt. And that's what they understand at the tower now as well. They say it's important to keep the current tilt due to the vital role this element played in promoting the tourism industry of Pisa. The vital role. The vital role is to keep the current tilt. Is that what you're doing? Are you trying to preserve the tilt in your life and the lives of others? Or are you busy trying to straighten people up and straighten people out? People don't visit the Leaning Tower of Pisa, even though it's leaning. They visit because it's leaning. They visit because of the flaw, because of the imperfection. The weakness is also a strength. My favorite quote that sums up my mission in life comes from E.E. Cummings. He said, we do not believe in ourselves until someone reveals that deep inside of us something is valuable worth listening to, worthy of our trust, sacred to our touch. What I hope to show you today is that some things that you saw about yourself that you thought were worthless are actually valuable, that you thought were negative were actually positive, that you thought were bad were actually good, that they were worth something, that they were worth listening to, worthy of our trust, sacred to our touch. And I hope when you leave today, I hope when you move on from today, you become a person that reveals to other people that deep inside of them something is valuable, worth listening to, worthy of our trust, sacred to our touch. I wrote a book called The Freak Factor, and that's what we talked about today. But even when I was talking to people about managing their lives and and managing their careers and managing their businesses, they were always wanting to talk to me about their children. And so I wrote a book called The Freak Factor for Kids. And It's a free video you can watch on YouTube. You can also get the book if you're interested, but that's not the point. The point is this lady, Stacy, she bought it for her son, Leo, and he was 10 years old and he had ADHD. And she took him the book and he read the book and he tore off a little piece of paper and he wrote me a note that I'll never forget. He said, thank you, Mr. Rendell, for the book. It made me feel better about who I am because I was the first person who told a 10-year-old with ADHD that deep inside of him was something was valuable, the very thing his ADHD that he'd been told is the most worthless thing about him, that it wasn't worthless, that it was valuable, worth listening to, worthy of our trust, sacred to our touch, because what makes us weird also makes us wonderful. And what makes us weak also makes us strong. Thank you very much for spending time with me. We have a little bit of time here for Q&A. So I'd love to hear from you all and uh, talk through any of the questions that you might have. David, we do have a question right now. Um... Yeah. Striving for strength all around equals mediocrity. How does this fit into the market when people want a generalist? So one of the weird sort of terms of this, and I've actually created an example of it in my new assessment is, you know, one of the profiles I have of strength and weakness is a versatile generalist. And so I think it's perfectly fine to be a generalist if that's who you are. Just don't try to turn yourself into a generalist if you're not like that. So we like to make fun of generalists and go, oh, jack of all trades, master of none. 
But if you are a person who likes to do a little bit of everything, you like to be involved in things, you don't like to go too far with things, you don't like to go too deep with things, but you like to be involved in a little bit of everything, there's a lot of situations that reward generalists. What I would say is that most of the time, companies are looking for generalists because they want people who can do a little bit of everything um, instead of getting the best person to do the things they need people to do. And it actually hurts their organization because they're not looking for real strength. They're looking for an absence of weakness or people who will just put in the time uh, to work on whatever it is. So I think too often we're, we're looking for generalists when we shouldn't. And I think the real answer is if you're, if you're not a generalist, don't try to be, look for situations that reward you for having uh, strong abilities in whatever it is you have. So I, I think a lot of corporations seem to reward um, generalists, um, but if that's not your style and that's not the way you wanna live your life or that's not the way you wanna work or those aren't your strengths, I would encourage you to try to stay out of those um, kinds of situations. I do think um, there's a great book called Range by David Epstein that talks about the value of being a generalist. There's also books that talk about the value of being a specialist. So to be clear, my message isn't be something other than you are. If you are a person who likes a lot of different things and you you like to move in a lot of different directions and you like to be involved in, in different subjects and different uh, areas and different jobs and, and you want to keep moving around and all that, just do that. But if, 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 if that's not who you are and that isn't your strength, then don't feel forced into that because that's what the job is. Again, Thorkel Son didn't just find the right fit for his son, he created the right fit. So even if you have to get creative or start your own business or put a couple of different jobs together or whatever, look for, constantly be looking for ways to find that right fit. Um, and if doing the generalist kind of job for you isn't, isn't the right thing, then don't do it. And I do encourage companies to not really do that, to allow people to be good at what they're good at and not have to do a little bit of everything. But too many companies do focus on that. And I think it ends up hurting the companies in the long run. Thank you, David, for sharing Freak Factor. Improving appreciates your dedication and generosity to the IT community.